talaga ng chance si Kuya Gomer. Man, so today we've learned that uh, the kids probably know more uh, memory verses than us. Uh, but that should challenge us instead of uh, discourage us. So and a blessing. Uh, thank you for the special numbers and for uh, uh, Preacher Gomer's uh, lively uh, emceeing. So we thank him for that. Um, so I've uh, asked uh, Brother uh, Haji to read the whole chapter six a while ago. So, but uh, we'll not be we'll not be finishing the whole chapter today. Uh, Let's we'll just see uh, how, uh, where where the time will permit us. But we'll, we'll be starting here in chapter six, and the title of the message is uh, "Now It's Personal." So uh, we have seen uh, we have read the verse, and I know that you have idea an idea of what they are trying to do to Nehemiah in this chapter. And I believe that we can, as I was, uh, as I was uh, finishing this message, as studying and meditating upon it, I cannot help but really uh, relate to what's happening here. And uh, I'm sorry, apologize in advance if I will uh, be giving uh, a lot of uh, illustrations, uh, personal experiences, not that they are the authority of the message, of course it's the word of God, but it is, I just see that uh, these things are easily applied to our lives as people who are, uh, uh, if we are people who are trying to really obey the Lord. So before we start, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, for the, uh, already the times that we've had this morning to study your word in our Bible classes and even in the Sunday school. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you're using this church to help us become deeper, dear Lord, in the word of God. I pray, Lord, that uh, everyone will take this opportunity, dear Lord, to uh, really uh, absorb a lot and meditate upon the things that we've been learning because all of them will be in vain, dear Lord, if they will not be uh, uh, something that will cause us to change our lives. And uh, it's not enough, Lord, that we are challenged by the message, but we have to make a decision to change as well uh, for the better. I pray, Lord, that you use this message as we look at the... Uh, um, personal attacks, dear Lord, of the enemies towards Nehemiah, and I pray, Lord, that we will be encouraged by his uh, 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 faith, his courage, and his resolve, dear Lord, to uh, obey you, finish the work, no matter what happens, and as if we, today, we find ourselves uh, in that kind of situation, I pray, Lord, that through your word, we will be encouraged, and that through the preaching, dear Lord, we will be blessed as well. Um, I pray, Lord, that you help us keep an open heart, dear Lord, an open mind, in order, and, and also a, a humble spirit uh, while listening to the message, dear Lord. May you remind me of the things that uh, I have uh, learned and studied in this chapter. And I pray, Lord, that you bless even our pastor as he will be preaching your word, uh, even preacher mon uh, as they preach, dear Lord, and become a blessing to other places. I pray that you use them to be a challenge as well and uh, to uh, uh, be a blessing, dear Lord, to those places. And I may be able to glorify your name this morning. Just name I pray. Amen. So we have read our, uh, mess, uh, our text a while ago. And last week, we've studied chapter 5, the whole chapter 5. We've seen uh, different, starting from uh, chapter 2, I believe, after Nehemiah, uh, 2 or 3, after Nehemiah's arrived in Jerusalem and tried and started the work. There, there have been many different attacks on him, uh, on, on them as a group. Uh, the people of the enemies don't, uh, cannot stand to see the work of God being done. That's why they don't stand idle, by, idle while, while God is being glorified. They, they do things in order to stop the work. And everything that they have done <clears throat> up to this point uh, is always towards the goal of stopping the work and, and getting the work to stop just a little bit in order for them to completely discourage the people and so that the wall will not be built. Now, we have seen them uh, um, intimidating them, trying to scare them, and uh, trying to ridicule them from all those kinds of attacks. We've seen how Nehemiah, through the wisdom of God and his leadership, has encouraged the people to keep on going, has reminded the people that God is behind this work, and has always challenged them to, uh, that, and motivated them to do it, not for themselves, but for, first of all for the Lord, but also for their family's safety. That's why these people who are building the wall have always been motivated, and uh, they have the resolve to finish it. 
compared to the times where they have started and stopped and then, uh, and then the wall just lay, laid waste uh, all of this time. But this time, they actually have the resolve to finish the work. And that is a blessing. And when you also saw last week that um, after the, uh, all of these attacks, the, the enemies uh, uh, tr stopped for a while. But then the, the attack or, or the problem came from the inside. Now, people themselves had a conflict with each other. And though Nehemiah was not, is not a book about finances or money, because Nehemiah never really had problems with money. The king, is, uh, the king has given him everything he needs in order to rebuild the wall. But then money had, uh, or, or material things has its way to rear its uh, ugly head. And, and, and it's made its way to the heart of people who are greedy, and it's made its way to the heart of the people who really need money and, and will resort into anything in order to get money and to, to put food on the table. That's why there were people who uh, um, uh, were in debt and up to the point that they had to sell their kids to be slaves to their fellow Jews. And these greedy people who, ha who are rich, wanting more, they took that and then put interest in, in the money that they're lending and took their lands, took their kids, and this got Nehemiah angry. Nehemiah didn't get angry with, with the enemies. Nehemiah was calm. He prayed to the Lord, encouraged the people. But when he saw that the problem was coming from the people uh, <clears throat> themselves, Nehemiah got angry. Angry, but then he tried. He composed himself, prayed to the Lord, rebuked them sharply. Okay, uh, there's a difference between getting angry at people and rebuking them sharply using the word of God. But as a good leader, he rebuked them sharply. And as people with the whole uh, uh, that are that is following God, they were able to listen, and then they showed fruits of repentance they didn't just say we're sorry they didn't just say we will not do it again but as uh, as much as it's in their power they tried to undo all of the things uh, that, that that they did so they uh, gave back their kids they gave back their the interest they gave back their land so that is really a, a good sign of true repentance <clears throat> a person who's really repenting will show uh, repentance not just say sorry not just like worldly sorrow but now in this chapter we've seen a completely we will see a completely different um, attack now it's a personal attack and it's really all geared towards Nehemiah the, the, pe the enemies now Sanballat, Tobiah and the, and the people that they have gathered, gathered together to stop the work they're not attacking the people now as a group they're attacking Nehemiah personally now they're trying to bring down the leader now they have they must have realized that through all these attacks, there's one common denominator why the people kept going, and that is a leader who is fully devoted into following the Lord. And no matter what they did to the people, even though they, they got discouraged, they got tired of all these things, a good leader knows how to use the Word of God in order to encourage again. Because we're not, we're not, uh, uh, we're not perfect or we're not uh, exempted from getting tired or getting discouraged we're gonna that's going to happen uh, uh, sometimes whenever we're doing the work of God but as a good leader as people of God we know how to encourage each other to keep on going and to give them strength again so Nehemiah was able to do this now these people have realized that and now they know who they have to destroy and who they have to bring down in order to stop the work altogether now let's go to verse number one and two here in chapter six it says here now it came to pass <clears throat> when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no bridge left therein though at that time had not set up the doors uh, upon the gates so the, the wall is almost finished they have completely done it uh, no more holes okay it's looking like a, a city now but then the gates are not there yet so it's not yet finished it's almost done though that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me saying come let us meet together some of uh, in some of some one of the villages in the place of Ono but they thought to do me mischief now the enemies will not just stand idle and watch these walls be built Okay, no ma even if it comes to the very last brick, they're going to attempt to stop the building of this wall. And if they had to kill these people, they're going to do it. And, and, and this, this, this is uh, uh, something that I realize. Uh, if if the, the work of the Lord is being done, and it's the work that is glorifying the Lord, the enemies will be hostile against it. But the real believers will not act in the same way. Now, sometimes there are believers inside the walls. 
Uh, there are unbelievers inside the walls. That's why when the walls are being built, they themselves are going to act in this kind of way. But a real believer, a real person will be happy about the work of the Lord. They will be happy that the work of the Lord is being done and it is glorifying the Lord. The enemies, though, will get angry. They are not going to, happy, to be happy about it. When people are getting saved, the un unbelievers are not happy. When people are going to the church, of course they're not happy. Why? Because other people are being better, they're being healed spiritually, while they, they themselves, their sins and their sinfulness and their, and their lack of a spiritual life will be magnified. That's why whenever you're doing the work of the Lord, whenever you're following the Lord, people are really going to uh, respond differently towards you. It's either they're, they're unbelievers or they're going to destroy you. They're going to try to bring you down to their level. They're going to try to make you commit sin. They're going to try to destroy your reputation. And, and even, the, even the carnal believers are going to do something against you when you're doing that. Okay, there's always going to be just one of two things. They're seeing you doing the will of God, they'll try to destroy you. Or they're going to see themselves as being a person who has to do the will of God as well. So you can either be a challenge to them or you're going to be a, uh, uh, someone that they want to destroy. Now, uh, even, even one of these things can happen to you. But of course, uh, as a, a faithful believer, you can always... Uh, you can just keep on going for the Lord. That's why as true believers, we should not feel bad when God is using someone for His glory. We should not feel bad when someone is being successful in the ministry. If God, if the, if the Bible commands us to rejoice and be glad in the midst of trouble, how much more should we rejoice and be glad in the midst of victory of our fellow believers? 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. That's why when God is using someone, lifting up someone, and, and, and glorifying His name through a person, we all have to rejoice with them. Now, there, there is this, uh, in our culture, there's this what we call crab mentality. When someone is try, is, God is lifting someone up, instead of being challenged to do, do the same, or instead of rejoicing with them, we try to pull them down. We try to stop them from doing that. 2 John 1, 4 says, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. A real believer will rejoice when God is using someone for His glory. That's why in here in this church, there's no place for jealousy. There's no place for envy. If God is using someone, let us rejoice. Especially if God is using that person for His glory and that person for the propagation of the gospel here. That's why if we have this kind of mentality like Sanballat and Tobiah, and even later on we're going to see that even the very people inside the walls, are, they are going to try to stop this work. Now, the enemies of Nehemiah were not happy, and then they knew exactly what they should do. They should destroy the leader. They should kill the king. They should assassinate the president. They should uh, sack the quarterback. They should uh, uh, try to get the star player to foul out. They should uh, try to slow down Kobe Bryant because you can never really stop him. But uh, the, thi the, the thing is they figured out that if you get this person who has been the reason that's why the wall is being built, then they figured out that everything will just crumble down. Now, what they're asking Nehemiah to do was very simple. Just to leave the work for a while and talk to us. And it's, it's, uh, there might be, uh, what do you call this? There might, there might not be a, a harm in that, but Nehemiah saw through their plan. Now, when the, when, when the enemies see or when, when the world sees that they cannot destroy the church as a group, when we are a strong church, when we love each other, when we protect each other, encourage each other, and see, and the enemies see that, that we're for each other, they can never destroy us as a group, the enemy will target individuals who, who he can affect and who can destroy the unity of the church. That's why we should not only be careful in how we treat each other and how we encourage each other, but we should also be careful individually to, to take care of ourselves. Why? Because only one person can destroy a very good church. One person can destroy a very good church. One destroyed testimony can destroy a very good church. That's why we have to be careful. That's why in the Bible, we are uh, compared to be a city, uh, a light like a city and light like a candle. We should, uh, we should shine as a group and we should shine individually as well. That's why it, uh, we should watch our devotion uh, to the Lord, read the Bible individually, get stronger, but also as a group, get stronger and love each other more and care for each other more. In that way, we can have this defense 
defense that the enemy cannot penetrate. But here, the enemies are trying to destroy the leader. The, Bi the Bible says here that they're, they're trying to do him mischief. The, the word mischief here means evil or injury or misery. Now, they, very, they may very well be trying to kill him. Now, the plain of Ono, where he's, they're trying to call uh, Nehemiah to, was a place outside of Jordan, but it was also near Samaria, where the enemies are. But this place is also considered as a neutral ground. So if, if people want to talk and, and try to negotiate something, that's where they go. Now, if, if you're Nehemiah, you're placed in that kind of position, you may think that this is an opportunity for peace. Right? This is an opportunity for, for, for us to get them off our backs and we can finish the wall uh, 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 without all these distractions. So Nehemiah could have easily thought that. He could have easily said this is a chance that, so that we can make peace with them, make friends with them, and that maybe they can even help us finish this thing. But then Nehemiah saw right through that. He says, but they thought to do me mischief because they can easily kill him on the way. Right? And, and, and not to mention the fact that he had to spend days to go there and come back. And he has to leave his people and stop the work. That's why this, this has been their goal from the beginning. And Nehemiah saw through that. Now, Nehemiah could have always also thought that, well, the wall is almost done. We just have to finish the gates. There's no harm in taking three days off talking to these people. But the problem is just that, that the wall is not yet finished. That's why Nehemiah has this result that no matter what happens, until it's completely finished, I'm not going to leave my people. That is his result. That's why what, however good uh, it sounds, come and meet together, let's talk. Nehemiah will not give up the work for that. And this is something that the world can throw at us as well. Uh, uh, the world can offer us this friendship of the world. And this is something that sounds good, but it is something that will also bring us away from the will of God. That's why we have to be careful with our friendships. We have to be careful with the people who we get close with. I'm not saying that we should not talk to anyone outside the church. I'm not saying that we should not uh, have friends outside the church. But then we should not fall in love with the friendship of this world. This world will offer us a lot of things, pleasure, companionship, and things that will give us a, a temporary joy. But if we will fall in love with those things, the system of this world, it will slowly drift us away from the plan and the will of God and we'll find ourselves outside the will of God eventually. So now, if, if you are a person who is uh, being enticed by the friendship of this world, we have to separate ourselves from that. We have to find the balance of having friends, maybe friends outside the church for the goal of bringing them in or just for the sake of being friends with them. Because if you're friends with them just for the sake of being friends with them, then you have the wrong idea. But if you're friends with them for the sake of bringing them in, then by all means be friends with them. But once you've done all you can, you need to learn how to separate yourselves from them. You need to learn how to show them that you are different and that you are not for their friendship. You are for their salvation and you are there only for them, for them to be able to know the Lord as their personal Lord and Savior. And outside of that, nothing else. That's why Nehemiah was, was, was able to see right through it. He doesn't need the friendship of these people. He doesn't need their help. He already has God helping them. He already has these people working with a great resolve to finish. And they were able to finish the walls uh, uh, even though it's almost, just almost finished in no time at all. And he doesn't need them. Now, they may offer him, maybe, maybe they, they do have good intentions, maybe they may want to offer him help, but then it's not even worth leaving the work just for a few days. That is, that is the kind of leader Nehemiah is. And now the enemies, we know that all they want to do against us, uh, do, do, do to us is to harm us. Psalm 37 verse 12 says, The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. Psalms 37, the verse 32 says, The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. How would you feel when you don't have, they don't have the Holy Spirit and then they see people doing the will of God, having good lives, doing good works. It's magnifying their sins right in front of their eyes. And if they don't want to repent, they would rather remove you from their sights. That's what they are doing here to Nehemiah. Now, um, that's why we have to be careful with uh, flattery, with uh, good words of the enemies because they're not going to entice you with, with, uh, with all these threats. They're going to entice you with their, with, with their uh, friendship. Now, Nehemiah immediately knew what's, what's, what, what is happening. Now, and now he's put in this kind of uh, position, but he knew what he's going to say. Now, 
It says here that uh, um, during this time, we saw that the, in, in the verses that we've read that the wall was almost finished. Now, this is also a good time and in the perfect timing of the enemy to get Nehemiah to maybe rest or maybe just stop for a while. Because when you're almost there at the finish line, that's when you sometimes put your guard down. That's so sometimes that's when you try to, okay, I'm tired. Uh, it's almost finished anyway. Rest up first. Put my guard down, and then that's that's the time when you're most vulnerable, and the devil will, and, and the devil is going to destroy you. That's why we have to be equally careful in failure and in success. We have to be equally uh, what they call this watchful, even when we're we're down or when we're up, when we're doing uh, great work for the Lord or where we're not, we're failing, failing in our work for the Lord. We have to be equally careful because the devil doesn't choose who he attacks he just attacks people that are the people of God now if we have victory against the devil victory after victory like Nehemiah it is very much easy for us to slowly remove our reliance upon God and rely upon ourselves why because we're almost at the finish line that's the time when when, when you if you're running a race that's the time when people are sta starting to stand and clap for you and, and it's a time when we can easily get distracted uh, uh, um, and remove our eyes from the Lord Jesus Christ, look at what we've done, admire our work, and maybe, maybe glorify ourselves just a little bit. And that is the time when, this, when Satan can really, really bring us down. Now, Nehemiah, the kind of leader he was from the beginning, his resolve never changed. He will never uh, leave the work of the Lord. That's why ver the verse says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Therefore, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. That's why even, even if you're already a long-time Christian and you've been having victories in your Christian life and God is using you mightily, it doesn't mean that you have to put your guard down. When the Lord said, be sober, be vigilant, He's talking to the carnal, He's talking to the faithful as well. He's talking to the new Christians. He's talking to the old Christians as well. And he's even talking to those Christians who are almost at the finish line to be careful, to be sober, and to be vigilant. Because the, the devil will not rest. And the devil is, all, is also uh, what do you call this? Uh, uh, persistent in what, what, what he is doing to us. Now Nehemiah has discernment. He saw right through it. He said, they thought to do me mischief. They're going to kill me. I know that. Now it might not be the same for everyone, but it's something, it's good if we have discernment. And contrary to what uh, we have been taught in the, uh, wherever we, are, we came from, certainly that, that was taught to me in the Philippines, that discernment is exclusive to pastors and leaders, which is far away from the truth. Discernment is given to people who have the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit tells us what to do. The Holy Spirit will lead us. That, that, that is the preaching even this morning. That God leads us. And we have the discernment to follow that. We, we have the discernment if the, if, if the devil is putting a trap in front of us. But that is something that is practiced. It's not, um, it's not magic. It's not that when, when you are in making, trying to make a big decision in your life, discernment will come. It doesn't work that way. It comes to a, to a person who constantly consults the Holy, Holy Spirit, constantly listens to the Holy Spirit, however small the decision is, so that you get used to it, you know what it's like, so when the big things come, the Lord can easily guide you and, and, and lead you. I suppose sometimes we think that we only need to pray and listen to the Holy Spirit when it's a big decision. But in, but in everyday small things, we don't have to pray. I can do that. I'm smart enough to do it. I don't need God for that. If that is your attitude, when the big things come, you're going to choose wrong. That's why discernment can come to each and every one of us. If we practice that, if we completely rely on the Lord, what ha whatever happens in our lives. That's why Nehemiah had this discernment. And he was a persistent person because we see in verse 3 and 4, And I sent messengers unto them, this is response, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sword, and I answered them after the same manner. Look at the response of Nehemiah. He didn't antagonize them. He didn't say, what do you think? Of? You think I'm stupid? You're going to kill me, I know. He didn't say that. What he said that, I'm doing a great work, and even though what you want is good, but the work is more important than that, I will not leave the work. Even though Nehemiah already knows that they are planning bad things, he didn't say it to their face. He didn't, he didn't give that kind of response. He didn't antagonize them. He just told them how important the work is for him. And we see that Nehemiah's priority is in the right place. 
It's in the right place because if you're offered pleasures, if you're offered uh, joy, temporary happiness in your life, you can maybe for a while leave the work of the Lord and, and try to enjoy life. But that means that your priorities are in the wrong place. Because if you know that your priorities is the work of the Lord, nothing can get you to come down. That's why Nehemiah said, it's important. I will not go down to leave this work just to talk to you. And we see here that Nehemiah was persistent. Four times they did this to him and he answered them the same thing. The same answer. Consistency, the same answer. Why? why how can Nehemiah give them the same answer? Because that's really his conviction. If Nehemiah was just pretending, he could have given a different answer in the third time or maybe the last time. But he had the same answer. Why? Because that is what's in his heart. It's just like lying. If you lie and, 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 and time passes by and they ask you the same question, you're not going to remember your lie because that's not in your heart, right? But Nehemiah, this is in his heart. The work is important for me. So whatever they say, whatever they do, I'm going to give them the same answer. The work of the Lord is important. I will not leave the work of the Lord. Do you have that, that kind of conviction? Do you have that kind of resolve? But what, is, what does it take for you to leave the work of the Lord? What does it take for you to, to, to get you to stop working for the Lord? Is it money? Is it the pleasures of this world? Is it your family? Because nothing is more important than the work of the Lord. And nothing should get us down, uh, take us down from that work. Nothing should, should make us stop from the work of the Lord. And if we don't have that conviction, the third time, fourth time, the fifth time, you know, even, if, even though Nehemiah was persistent, we must also realize that the enemies were equally persistent. They have been trying to stop the work from the beginning until now. And even though if they're going to try to put up the last gate in that wall, they're still going to try to do something to stop it. If we think oh, you're persistent, I believe that the enemy, the devil is more persistent than you. He'll, he's going to try to tempt you again and again and again and again. And if it's not your conviction to keep on working for the Lord, you're going to give in someday. You're going to give in somehow. But if you make it your conviction, if you're doing the work of the Lord because you know it's right, because you know it will glorify the Lord, and because that's who you are, no matter how they try to come at you, you're going to answer them the same thing. That's why in, work, in, in doing the work of the Lord, it's also important to know why you're doing it. Because if Nehemiah is just doing it for the money, he will give in some, somehow. If Nehemiah was just doing it for fame or, or, or for, uh, for, for authority, he will give in. But Nehemiah is doing it for the glory of God and he knows it's right. That's why he's not giving in. Okay? That's why us, in, in, whenever we're doing the work of the Lord, we must also know why we're doing it. Search our hearts. Why are we here? Why are we listening to the preaching? Why are we going to the outreach? Why are we singing for the Lord? Why are we preaching? And if you're doing it for selfish reasons, you're going to give up someday. But if you're doing it for the Lord, and you're doing it in the power of His might, no matter how, what people tell you, no matter what the, this world offers you, you're not going to even look, at, look that way. You're going to be focused doing the work of the Lord. That's why Nehemiah, this is the kind of person Nehemiah was. Now come to think of it, this verse can be easily given to politi pastor politicians today. Look at the verse again. I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Everything that is not the work of the Lord, in Nehemiah's eyes, it is a demotion. I will not come down. This is my priority. This is the best thing that I'm going to do. This is the calling of the Lord in my life. I will not do anything to lessen my effectivity in what I'm doing. It's completely different from our time today. I, I, I can do this on the side. Uh, I can be this and that at the same time. Anyway, the work of the Lord is, already, is almost finished anyway. But the point is, it's not yet finished. And as long as you're living the calling of the Lord in your life, it's still the same. You have to keep working on it until the time that He takes you back home. That's why Nehemiah says, I'm not going to come down. I'm not going to go to you and, uh, and, and uh, uh, really talk to you. Besides, if you're really sincere in talking and being friends, you will be the one coming to me. You will not get me to stop what I'm doing. Now, Nehemiah was persistent again, but the enemies were equally persistent because the enemies know that some of us are just pretending. The enemies know that some of us will give in somehow. And he can use any one of us that's sitting in this church to destroy the unity of this church. That's why we have to be careful. It's not enough to say no once the, once the offer is here. It's not enough to say no four or five times. We should say no 
uh, however, uh, what do you call this? However, uh, uh, many times the, 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 the offer comes our way. Because no, no matter if we say no many times, we say yes one time, all those no's are meaningless. Now, it's, it's the same thing as, as like, uh, less, like training a child. You say no to them, but just say yes once. They're going to know that yeah, it's okay. My dad is not serious about this. He has a price. Right? That's why you can say no to your kid many times. You say yes once, they're not going to believe your no anymore. They know that they can get you to say yes. Now, this is the same thing as the enemy. You say no all the time, eh? I'm going to get you to say yes someday. But if you keep saying no, then, and if you, that's really your conviction and your belief, then you're going to, uh, you're going to be, uh, be able to keep working on the Lord. That's why it's, it's good na, na kaya din natin mag humindi. Because, you know, when the, off, when the enemy offer us something, it's always going to look good. It's always going to sound good. It's always going to be for our benefit. It's always going to be for our family's benefit. And these things, believe it or not, it's very hard to say no to them. They don't look bad. They look good, but they're not the will of God. We have to be able to discern that. Now let's read verse number 5 to 7. Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. Wherein was written, it is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king, according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. Now the enemies turn up the heat. They're now slandering Nehemiah. Now look at the letter. Look at the content of the letter. Nehemiah is so busy building the wall, he doesn't have time to appoint prophets to preach in Jerusalem and saying that he wants to be king and to plan a rebellion nonetheless. But these people are trying to slander him. These people are trying to destroy his reputation among, among his brethren and among even the king. Now, what they're saying and what they're accusing Nehemiah of, that he's rebellious, that he's selfish, and that he has his own reasons why he's rebuilding the wall. Now, if this thing will go to the king, if the king will actually hear about, about this, he will immediately stop the work and he will have Nehemiah killed. Remember, who allowed him to build the wall? It's the king. Who, allowed, who gave him the money to do it? It was the king. Who protected him from the palace to, to, to Jerusalem? It was the king. And if the king will somehow realize that he did all these things to take the kingdom from him, what would the king do? How would he react? He will have Nehemiah killed. Now, that's why Nehemiah is, is uh, what they call this, is uh, caught between this, this, this thing. He's caught between trying to stop the work, dealing with it, or just keep working and trusting the Lord. That is, his, that is his choice. Because, if, because this is real danger. If this, act, this news actually reaches the king, everything is finished. So it's really uh, uh, just logical for him to stop for a while, deal with it, talk to them, okay, and stop the rumor. But Nehemiah still knows that even though my life will be in danger, it's still not enough for me to stop. That is the resolve that he has. And that is something that I pray I have. I don't know until it's... It's, it's, it's being tested in me at the heat of the moment. But that is the prayer. And we don't know that for ourselves as well. If we are being threatened of our very lives, can we still keep on going for the Lord? Or are we going to stop for a while and take care of it and come down from the work? Now, this world is going to entice us and tempt us to compromise. We have to, uh, the, 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 the thing is, he has to compromise. If he wants to defuse the situation, he has to stop the work. When he said that he's not going to stop the work, but this time he has to, that is compromise. Now the world, it will try to get us to compromise and destroy our reputation. Parabang, aakitin ka nila, do this first, trabaho ka muna, do this, and once you do it, they're going to use that against you to destroy your reputation. Yan ang gagawin nila. Now, if, if Nehemiah said, okay, Let's stop the work. I'll meet with you. Let's take care of this. They can easily tell the people, look at your leader. He left you. There's a threat for your lives. Your leader left you and he went to talk with us. Nehemiah's credibility now as a leader is destroyed. That's why Nehemiah is caught, bit, uh, caught in the middle of something that is a very difficult situation for him. Now, this is something that is not different. 
uh, uh, the enemy slandering the, the, uh, the believers is not so something that we should be surprised about. Because it's something that he's been doing all this time. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. The apostle Paul says this, Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the field of the world and are the offscoring of all things unto this day. The whole life of apostle Paul, he was being slandered. Wherever he goes, people are destroying his name, saying lies about him. Even in the very churches that he started, once he leaves, enemies going to come in and destroy his reputation. That is the whole life of Apostle Paul when he started to believe Christ. He was being slandered throughout his life until he died. But what did he say? Being defamed, exactly being slandered, or being lied about, or his reputation being destroyed, we entreat. Hindi siya lumalaban. Okay? He just entreat the people. He just tried to reason with them and tried to protect his reputation. Now, this should be nothing new to us. If we are being defamed, if we are being slandered, we should know that this is coming. We, we're, we're only going to react badly if we didn't expect it. But the Bible already says that. It already happened from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Don't think that it's not going to happen to you. Because if the, if the enemy cannot get you to stop working by threatening your lifestyle or by threatening... You're, you're, or by ridiculing you or by, by trying to scare you, the enemy is going to stop you by, by destroying your reputation. Now you have to think, is my reputation more important than the work of the Lord? Now that is a very difficult decision. Because you can, you can easily pause for a while and take care of your reputation. But once you start doing that, you'll never know the end of it. It's going to keep going and keep going and then you find yourself living a life just protecting your reputation until you die. That is what the enemy is trying to do. Now you have to make a decision now. Be, 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 uh, be, have the commit, uh, commitment to the Lord and have the conviction that my reputation is not above the work of the Lord. And even if the world thinks I'm crazy, it's, it doesn't matter. I'm going to keep going. Even if the people think I'm a bad person, it's okay. I'm going to keep going because the work of the Lord is more important than that. I don't think anything will get Nehemiah to stop doing the work. Anything at all. He got angry a bit because of the people, but he will keep on working. And it doesn't matter even if the king himself will think bad about him. I will keep working. It's almost finished. I will keep working. Now, how does Paul respond with this kind of things? They, he, Paul knows that it's not his job to keep on fighting for her, his reputation. Actually, we see in his letters that he only protects himself, his name, to the believers. Okay, if he's being destroyed, he will write a letter to the believers and explain what happened. But he never does the same thing with the unbelievers. He doesn't go around city to city and saying, eh, it's not true what they're saying about me. No, he goes around city to city preaching the gospel and that's it. No matter what these people think of him. Remember, they tried even to stone him uh, to the point of uh, almost killing him. But all he cares about is preaching the gospel. But when it comes to the body of believers, he will, he will protect his reputation. He will explain it to them. He will write letters to them. But he never fights back in the way that the enemy is fighting them. And this is something that is very hard to do. When people are destroying your name, it's very hard to fight off the temptation to fight back. Very hard. Because you have, because it's your name. It's, 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 it's how people know you. It's how people look at you. It is some, it's, it's even your life. That's why it's hard to fight the temptation to fight back. And sometimes, and many times, I've, personally, I've failed in doing that. People uh, destroying my reputation, I have to fight back. I have to protect it, or, or else no one's ever going to listen to me. But it's not my job to do that. It is the Lord's job. What, what, with, what did God say in, in Matthew, Christ say in Matthew 5, 44? But I say unto you, what? Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good unto them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, Paul did not fight back because he's obeying the commandment of Christ to love this people and this is something i don't think you can honestly raise your hand and say i can love them no matter what because this is not a natural kind of love it's not a love that is uh, that emotion is involved because if you will let emotion be involved in this you will never love people who are destroying your name it's impossible this is a love that comes from the lord this is a love that only believers can give why? Because we've experienced the grace of God, we've experienced the love of God, and by His grace, we can love our enemies. They're not only trying to uh, uh, obey the command of the Lord, but they're trying to imitate Christ Himself. 
What did Christ say in Luke 23, 34 when he was crucified on the cross? Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast his lot. They crucified him. They hurt him in ways that we can never imagine. But what did he say in his very dying moment? Father, forgive them. That is the love that we should have for these people. Kaya nga po mga kapatid, it's not an easy, uh, it's not an easy commandment to follow, to love your enemies, to love them, to have compassion towards them. Why? Because Christ is right. They don't know what they're doing. Magagalit ka ba sa tao na hindi man niya alam yung ginagawa niya? Di ba? If you see someone doing something that is really stupid, but because they're not, but because they don't know really how to do it, are you gonna get angry with them? Of course not. Now, they're just trying to destroy your name because they wholly believe that what you're doing is wrong. That what you're doing is not right. They believe that in their hearts. Otherwise, they're not going to destroy you. But they're destroying you. Why? Because they don't know what you're doing. The enemies of Nehemiah, they don't know what he's doing. They're trying their best to destroy him. They're trying their best to destroy his reputation because they don't know the work of the Lord. That's why in Nehemiah, it, it's not even worth his anger to go down to them and take care of them. It's not worth it. That's why as believers, we have to make a, res a resolve now. That if my reputation is on the line, it's still the work of the Lord who's going to take priority in my life. Not my reputation. And if the Lord sees it fit to take care of them, praise the Lord. And if the Lord doesn't take care of them, it doesn't matter. Until I die, I'm going to keep working the work of the Lord. Why? You start listening to them, it's going to destroy you. Start listening to them. You're not going to do the work of the Lord anymore. Now, the subtlety of the offer to Nehemiah here is they're giving him a way out. Now, they're saying that, okay, there's a rumor, Nehemiah, that you're trying to be king. You're planning a rebellion. Now, talk to us. Let's see how we're going to deal with it. Now, this offer is now even more enticing. Kung kanina cheesecake yung offer, chocolate cake na ito, hindi mo na ito matatanggihan. Say, kailangan, tutulungan ka namin. The king is going to kill you, but with our help, maybe we can, we can, we can talk to you how, how we're going to deal with this. Now, even that, Nehemiah said no. Now, to add to this, this was an open letter. Now, during those times, when a letter is very important, it's going to be sealed so that the bearer cannot read it. But this was an open letter to the very purpose that the bearer will read it and along the way will talk to people about it. That, that, in, in that way, before the letter reaches Nehemiah, people already knew what was happening. And now they're waiting for Nehemiah. How is he going to respond? This is a real danger. If the king really believes that we are rebelling, it's not only Nehemiah's head that will be taken, it's everyone's head. Now, they knew it. The, the devil is really subtle. He, he, he uh, what do you call this? He really uh, uh, made it in purpose. Uh, he purposed it so that the people will know about what, what they're saying to Nehemiah. Why? Because if Nehemiah doesn't do anything about it, it can affect them. Right? For example, you know that you have to be, uh, that the leader's job is to protect you, but he's not doing his work. Your, your loyalty to him is going to, is go, is going to die. That's why, uh, that's why the only reason why, or the only way for this thing to work is that if these people will believe the rumor. Okay, there's a rumor going on. Nehemiah wants to be king. He's using us to rebel against the king. What's he going to do about it? Now, if these people will believe that rumor, everything will crumble. Everything will, because they're going to fight even Nehemiah. But the thing is, these people did not believe it. They kept on working. They kept on, why? Because they had a, tr they had, uh, a trust in Nehemiah. But then here, the downfall of many churches today is, the, is one word, gossip. Rumor. And if people start believing rumor and gossip that's going around, instead of being faithful to the man of God, instead of being faithful to the work of the Lord, we're going to start to fight each other. This is something that I believe that every one of us here has experienced. Gossip. We have experienced to gossip. We have, been ex we have experienced to be the subject of gossip. And it's, it's something that is really difficult to enjoy. Especially if you know that the gossip about you is something that would make people look differently at, uh, to you. Nagbabago ang tingin nila sa'yo. Hindi ko alam sa English yun. So, that's why it's very hard. That's why when rumors start spreading, our job is to kill it. But as a church, we can easily be destroyed because of that. And, 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 and as a young uh, preacher, 
uh, until now, of course. But when I was st starting to preach, and af after after my Bible seminary, even starting at the seminary, when I went there, my very first year, already a lot of, uh, uh, I I heard a lot of things, and it's actually came from the, uh, I don't know, just secret na lang, kasi kilala sila ni Ate Blue. But uh, dito. But a lot of things. Were, were, were being said about me. You know, the gossip uh, or, or the things that you can read on Facebook whenever they're attacking me or whatever. A lot of these things, there are 300 members there, more than 300, I believe. All of them knows about it in less than a year. Not a single soul came to me and talked to me about it. That is how different. I came back here to Cambodia, um, uh, of course, helping my dad with the work. I graduated. Everyone also knows about it. Not a single soul talked to me. Not a single one. That means the gossip went from one ear to another without it, it finding its way to me. Now, going, uh, now knowing that all of, all of the missionaries in Phnom Penh knows as well, and not a single one asked me about it. Now, I can get mad and fight them back, which is what I did for a while, but then it just removed the joy in my heart. It made me bitter. It made me someone who doesn't want to do the work of the Lord in the first place. Now, there's this one pastor, and, and some of you have attended his church before. He actually had the audacity to call me, but he didn't call me to confirm. He called me to say, I believe the rumor, and you have to do something about it. <laughs> you believe it without asking me? What kind of brain do you have? That's why and I, turned off the, I turned off the phone. That's why I told him. But it put bitterness in my heart. It was a Sunday, and I'm going to preach. After he called me and it removed that joy uh, in me that very night. That's why gossip can easily destroy the church. Kaya nga po, dapat ingat po tayo sa chismis. Why? Whenever gossip reaches our ears, it has to stop there. It's either you rebuke the person who's talking or you go straight to the person that he's talking about. That is the only job we can do. It's not your job to pass it along. Why? Because gossip will destroy the reputation of people. Proverbs 20 verse 19. He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets. Therefore, what? Meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Proverbs 16, 28. A forward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. No matter how strong this church is, a rumor or a simple gossip can destroy us. Proverbs 18, 8. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. 1 Timothy 5.13, And withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. Yung mga wala daw magawa, nagbabahay-bahay, nagkakalat ng chismis. James 1.26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Very strong words. No matter how good you look, no matter if you sing, no matter if you go to the outreach, if you cannot control your tongue, it's all in vain. That's what the what this verse is saying. Exodus 23, 1. Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an out, uh, unrighteous witness. Proverbs 10, 18. He that hideth hatred with, with his lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is what? A fool. A fool literally means stupid. Tanga. Sabi, yung mga tao na nagpapasa ng chismis, ano daw? Tanga. Yung nasabi ng Bible, Proverbs 11, 9. A hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. You don't know how gossip can destroy a person. Pers in, in his fire in serving the Lord. Rumors can either... Because rumors, the trace of rumors are first, the source is rarely revealed. Pag nagchichismis ka, hindi mo sasabihin kung kanino galing. Never, you will never reveal that. Number two, they are inaccurate and exaggerated. Look at the, the letter of Nehem, uh, against Nehemiah. The only true thing in that letter is that he's building the wall. Everything else is false. Right? It's, it's rarely accurate. It is designed for the purpose of hurting. No rumor is designed for the purpose of helping. It's always for designed for the purpose of hurting. That's why if you pass it along, you are now uh, 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 helping to hurt that person. And if you really love your brother, you will never pass along a rumor. Hindi hindi ka chismis because pag nag pagka nakipag participate ka sa chismis or sa gossip, sinasaktan mo yung kapwa mo. And you don't really love your person. And no one enjoys being falsely accused. 
No one enjoys that. However great your resolve is, you're not going to enjoy people talking behind your back. Why? It drains your desire to, for uh, what you're doing. It reduces your happiness. It robs you of your sleep. It takes away your laughter. It increases the frustration and anger. We're tao lang po tayo. Magagalit, magagalit ka pag may narinig ka ng ganyan. And there are times na kung hindi mo ma-overcome, you're going to make a decision that you regret for the rest of your life. And the reason why that happened is because of people who cannot control their mouth. Kaya nga po, kung gusto natin ipasa yung chismis, ipasa mo dun sa subject ng chismis. Why? To know the truth. Now, if you know the truth, and it's already the truth, no, sige, ipas, kung talagang totoo, sabihin mo sa iba. If you really have a good purpose in your heart, but this is what they're doing to Nehemiah because this is something that is very difficult to really resist. Nata kailangan na niyang gawin. It's either aasikasuhin niya or katapusin niya yung wall. Anong decision ni Nehemiah? If you are caught in that kind of situation, what are you going to do? Uh, personally, I have tried. I have. Uh, uh, I, it's, it's been uh, playing in my mind for a long time. Am I going to deal with it once and for all? But I know that if I start doing that, it's going to take a long time. I'm going to waste a lot of time that I, that I should have given for the Lord. So something that, a uh, temptation that keeps coming up personally in my life. But if you're caught in this kind of situation, the only response is to trust the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy path. It should always occur to your mind, the Lord knows the answer. He knows the answer. And if you ask Him for it, He's going to tell you. The problem is, before asking Him, we've already devised our own plans, we've already devised our own steps, and we forgot to ask the person who knows the future already. That's why you have to do that. And, and, and go, going to the next verses in verse 8 and 9, this is Nehemiah's response. Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou faint Painest them out of thine own heart. Nito to yan. Gawa gawa mo lang yan. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now, what did he, what did he ask God for? Therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Why? Because it's impossible for Nehemiah not to fear even a single fear in his heart. Of course, when he heard that, there's fear in his heart. It's the king now we're talking about. It's not just these people who we can actually fight, but it's the king. If the king is against me, this wall is not going to be finished. And if the king is against us, he's the first one who allowed us to do this in the first place. He's going to stop it. There's fear. That's why he said, God, strengthen my hands. Not only his hands, even for the people. Now, Nehemiah confronts his enemy by boldly rebuking them. Hindi totoo yan. Gawa gawa mo lang yan and defending the truth. You know, it's easy to defend the truth. Why? And it's easy to be bold when you're defending the truth. Because for the simple reason that, because it's the truth. If you're not going to fight for the truth, you're not going to fight for anything. That's why if the truth is being slandered, it's easy to fight for it and be bold about it. Okay? But kasi totoo, hindi magbabago yan. Kung totoo yan, ipaglalaban mo, palagi mo dapat ipaglaban yan. Now, Nehemiah fought for it. He said that it's not true. You're just making this up. But after that, he kneeled, Lord, strengthen me. Because he knows something can happen. And he knows that this is a very real threat. Now, sa atin, I don't know if we, if we can uh, uh, do, uh, do this kind of thing, but whenever we're faced with, with uh, this kind of danger and slander is being thrown at us, reputation is being uh, 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 destroyed and you're feeling weak, again, as I have said, as Nehemiah have always, has always done, always just rely upon the strength of the Lord. Whenever there's insecurity, intimidation, you're doubting yourself and all of these things, go to the Lord in prayer. Pray to Him. Rely upon Him. He's going to give you strength. Isaiah 41.10 Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. 2 Corinthians 9.10 And He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. That's why even if we pray for the Lord, 
to take away this thing. And even if He doesn't take it away, we should just keep relying on Him. Why? Because we can experience His grace so much more in this kind of situation. But if we fail to do that, we're going to be tired, we're going to be weak, and we're just going to stop. The Lord can strengthen us in any situation like nobody else can. That's why we have to go, go to Him first and trust His grace. Verse number 10. Afterward, I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Metab uh, Mehatabil, who was shut up. And he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night they will come to slay thee. Now, we've, we can read in verse 12 that this person is fake. He was hired by Sanballat and Tobiah. But look at the enemy's plan. They are fighting him from the outside, but they also hired someone from the inside to bait Nehemiah into disobeying the Lord. What did he say? The, the verse says that this person, Shemaiah, was shut up. It doesn't mean that he's not saying anything because he's talking. It, shut up here means that there's fear in his heart. He was pretending that his life is also in danger. Okay, and he prophesied. That's why we know, and that's why we know that he is a priest because uh, he has access to the temple because he's inviting him to go to the temple. Now he said to Nehemiah, "This night you are going to be killed. The only thing you have to do is come with me to the temple and let's close the doors, and you're going to be safe." Now, if you know the rule of the Lord, a person who's not a priest should not enter the temple. And if Nehemiah doesn't know that. It's easy to say, this is a friend, he's in the walls, he's caring for my safety, he wants to protect me. What's the harm in going to the temple and hiding there for a night so that I will not be killed? But that is not the kind of person Nehemiah was. He's not a person who will run away from danger to save his own life and leave the people of God. He's not that kind of leader. What, anong mararamdaman natin if we have the kind of leader who protects himself first before protecting the people? Now, Nehemiah, for him, it's the people first. We'll protect them. Okay, they're, they're my people. They're the people God entrusted to me. I'm not going to hide just to protect myself. Okay, so, but Nehemiah saw right through it. Now, this is also, as I, 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 I'm studying this, this is also the tradition or the practice of the heathen. Because the, in the heathen temples, even if you're a criminal, you did something wrong, if you're inside the temple, no one can touch you. But the law of the Lord is different. If you're not a priest, don't go in the temple. Remember King Uzziah? He went into the temple. God killed him immediately. Now Nehemiah knows that. Now this priest wants to get Nehemiah to go into the temple. To commit what? Sin. Because it's a sin to disobey the, the law of the Lord. That's why all of this temptation is to get you to compromise and to get you to commit sin. Why? It's easier to, to restore, destroy your reputation if you've actually done something wrong. Kaya nga, ang dali na. Ay, nagkasala na si Nehemiah. Madali na siya sirain. Tignan niyo yung leader niyo. Bawal pumasok doon. Siya pa nauna. Takot kasi. Gusto kasi yung save yung sarili niya. He knows it's wrong. And he's again saw right through it. Verse number 11. And they said, Should such a man as I flee? It's not a kind of person I am. And who is there that being as I am, being the leader of these people, and, and being, not being a priest, would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. That's what he said. That's not the kind of person I am. Tatakbo ba ako when there's danger? Yung leader pa yung unang tatakbo at magtatago? No. He should be the one protecting them. And Nehemiah's response was very quick. Why? Because that's what's in his heart. Because he has purposed that in his heart. Like Daniel. In Daniel 1.8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. If we don't have that purpose in our heart before the time comes, and if we just try to make the decision when that temptation comes, we're going to give in. Kung hindi pa talaga dinesisyon ni Nehemiah noon pa na, pa na hindi siya tatakbo, natatapusin niya ang wall, I believe that papasok siya sa temple kasi matatakot siya. But he already had that purpose in his heart. I will not stop working until it's finished. So no matter how good that offer is to hide and save my life, I will not do it. Kasi nandiyan na purpose na conviction na yun. Kaya nga po mga kapatid, it's good to develop that kind of conviction. I've been saying it over and over again, but if we have this kind of this conviction if we have this kind of purpose in our heart no matter what they throw at us we're just gonna say no i'm not going to do it no matter how good it looks no matter how good it sounds i, I remember this from the first uh first uh, uh student convention i 
attended in Sihanoukville. Uh, the, the pastor said, I think his name is Eric, I forgot. But it's, he said that uh, decide even before the time to decide comes so that when the time to decide comes, you would have already decided. Purpose mo na sa sarili mo na pagka merong nang gan- nang ganito nangyari, hindi ko iiwanan ang gawain ng Panginoon. Para pagdating noon, maalala mo, this is my decision, I have already made the decision, hindi ko iiwanan ang gawain ng Panginoon. Pero kung dun ka palang magdi-decide, life and death situation, of course you're gonna choose your life. But because Nehemiah already has that kind of thing in his heart, he's convicted to keep on working. Psalm 57.7 says, My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Psalm 112 verse 7, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. Why? His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. This should be the thing that, uh, uh, that, that should make us, if you don't have a purpose, wala kang conviction, kapatid, compromise at compromise ka. If you stay, if stayed here in this place, we've been preaching the word of God to you, and if you don't develop any kind of conviction in your heart at all, pag uwi mo, babalik ka lang sa dati. Why? Sinayang mo ang panahon mo. You didn't develop that conviction. If you're convicted, Lord, I'm going to stand by the truth. And even if there is no church in the place that I'm going to, who's standing by the truth, Lord, I am not going to give in and join a church who's not doing the truth. And if you're not convicted, madali ka lang. Bibigay. Lalo na kung sa simbahan na yun, andun ang pamilya mo. Right? What, ka, anong, ano, papaano natin ngayon uh, titimbangin? You know, Pastor Jesse always tells me that you will see how much they love the truth when they're faced in that situation. Gaano ba talaga kamahal ang katotohanan? Mas mahal mo ba yung pamilya mo sa katotohanan? Of course, some of us will say yes. And no one can blame you because they're your family. But then I believe that the Lord's truth is always worth fighting for and standing, standing for. That's why we have to stand. When Paul was stoned to death, almost to death, he, was rec- he recovered, he went on his journey, but on his way back from that journey, he went to the same place where he was stoned, he stoned as well. Because he has this conviction. He's not afraid. Even if I die serving the Lord, I've already made up my mind, I'm going to die serving the Lord. So no matter if they stone me again, let them do it. Because that is already my conviction. That's why he can say, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The reason why we keep on moving, we keep on compromising, is we don't really believe that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Kasi sa tingin natin, all of these are nothing. It's not worth fighting for. And if that is in your mind, lalo ka, lagi ka lang magkakompromise, kapatid. That's why uh, we have to be steadfast. We have to be unmovable. Okay? Uh, even in the face of danger, in the face of our very own lives uh, being taken away from us. Now, Nehemiah was not one to run away from danger. He's that kind of leader. Verse 12 and 13, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll just end up with this. And I, and lo, I perceived that God had not sent him. His discernment again. But that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so and sin and that they might have matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. The, the, the enemies were trying to get Nehemiah to commit sin in order to destroy his testimony. He's getting them to commit sin by scaring him into doing that. Now if we're afraid, if we let fear make our decisions from us for us, then we're going to make the wrong decisions. That's why the, the Bible says the Lord had not given us the spirit of fear. It means that when faced with this kind of situation, you might feel that fear, but you're not going to let that fear dictate what you're going to do. You let your conviction, you let the word of God, you let the truth, uh, uh, the, what they call this, uh, uh, dictate what you're going to do. Now, I don't know if you find yourself in any kind of situation that Nehemiah finds himself in. Of course, it's a big thing. It's the lives of people. It's his name here. But I believe that you've been put in this kind of situation where you don't know what to do. It's perfectly okay to stop working for a bit to take care of things. But look at your heart. Think yung conviction natin. And what will it take to get you to stop working? Because these people are now desperate. They know nothing is going to stop Nehemiah from working. That's why they stopped all of these threats towards the people and they just threatened him, him personally. They did everything they can to offer friendship, they offered him friendship, let's meet. They, they, they dis- uh, threatened him, destroying his reputation. And they even hired someone 
to pretend to take care of him and save his life. But none of these things is heavier in his heart than the work of the Lord. Is that the kind of conviction you have today? That no matter where the Lord takes you, you're not going to compromise. No matter where the Lord brings you or no matter what the devil throws in front of you, you're not going to compromise your faith and your resolve and your conviction to the Lord. Is that something you have today? Or maybe you have doubts that if I'm faced with this situation, I don't know what to do. I will not know what to do. If, if it's come to choosing myself and my family in the truth, I think I'm going to choose my family. If it comes to my reputation and the work of the Lord, I think I'm going to take care of my reputation first. If, it's, if that's in your mind, then pray to the Lord. Ask Him, Lord, please give me this kind of resolve and conviction that Nehemiah has. Please, Lord, show me how important the truth is and how much I need to give for the truth and how you're going to bless me if I stand by you and how you're going to strengthen me. It's only the Lord who can give us that kind of conviction. And it, we have to pray for it. In the midst of this country where people do not believe what we're believing. In the midst of this country where, pe where people will accept what we're giving, but will not really turn their backs on what they're doing. We have to keep on standing, keep on preaching. And no matter what happens, we're going to do that. Let's, let's ask the Lord that he, he gives us that kind of conviction today. Let's all stand and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, the preaching. We thank you, Lord, for the...